All right. Good morning and welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. I'm Rachel Marshall, one of your co-hosts here, along with Bruce Weiner, and we have a special guest today, Ari Mizell. So Ari, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And before we jump into your story and what we're going to be talking about today, I wanted to just give a little bit of background. And that is that if you are in the position of saying, I have huge goals for this year or for my life, actually, um, this is really a conversation you want to tune into because it's critical to realize that the hustle and the work extra hard and the do all the things is I don't even know if that's so last year, last decade, last century. It's just really not the answer for today. And Ari is here to talk about really how you can do less and optimize and really drive and build that productivity by not doing all the things. So this is a conversation really important to us here as we want to help people build lives and businesses that they love, really be able to achieve their goals, work in their unique ability, build a self-sustaining business. And so I think this conversation is going to be excellent. Um, Bruce, any thoughts that you have that you want to share uh, before we get started here? Well, yeah, I, I try to work on myself every single day. Um, personally. And I think anybody that's listening to this really needs to listen to the entire con- context and content of what we're trying to get across today. Because Ari, um, you know, from, from uh, knowing about you on the fringe a little bit, we had a, a common client, Jonathan Dyson, uh, for a while. And so I really dug into some of your content. And I really appreciate a couple of steps. I think people uh, can can learn from you today. Um, one of them that really resonated with me because I I believe the same thing, and I and I don't know if we say it the same way, but I always say I don't believe in work life balance. I just believe in life, and you just need to set your uh, work up the proper way, and that's kind of your specialty is setting the work up the proper way to make people productive. So people are going to get a lot out of this video, and that's what that's what Rachel and I's uh, goal is every video is to bring in people that can help an entrepreneur's life become even more and more productive. So uh, grab a beverage and listen to the entire thing that Ari has to to talk to you about today. Bruce, it's a little uh, early in the morning for people to have a beverage. (laughs) (laughs) If you're catching this live, just be careful with, uh, with that beverage choice. Water is the excellent coffee, you know, all the, all the good stuff. Um, so Ari, let's go ahead and um, jump in and, and talk about what led you to this position in your life. I know that there's a huge backstory for you, and I think that'd be really beneficial for our listeners to understand what came before the books. I know that we've got uh, the replaceable founder, the art of doing, uh, oh, sorry, the art of doing less on productivity. Less, art of less doing. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I totally botched that one. The art of less doing um, on productivity and idea to execution among several others. So what, what led you to this realization that you need to have less doing and what did that look like for you personally? Yeah. So the, uh, the, the sort of quick backstory on that is that when I got out of college, I was working in real estate development and construction in upstate New York and working a very, very hard sort of daily schedule and under a lot of a lot of stress and not taking really good care of myself and when I was 23 I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease Mm. Uh, Crohn's is an inflammatory condition that affects the digestive tract it's considered to be incurable and uh, very debilitating very painful and I was Mm. eventually I was able to overcome that illness and that's maybe a separate story but the short the long and the short of it is that I went from working 18 hours a day to working an hour a day, uh, mm. basically very in very short order. And that was sort of a restriction that was placed on me based on the, the physical and mental energy that I had to get things done. Mm. And there's all sorts of productivity systems out there. And there were at the time to help you, you know, get the most out of your day. And there really wasn't much that addressed the issue of really legitimately having absolutely no time to get things done, but still having to get them done. And so let's do it was born out of that, that extreme restriction. So the framework was to optimize, automate and outsource everything in my life in order to be as effective as possible. Over the years that's developed into books, teaching, speaking, coaching, uh, consulting, and more of a business focused methodology, which I call the replaceable founder. And I've been doing that for about 11 years now. And then I ended up here. 
That's you know, I, that was one. That was one of the concepts uh, that I uh, read for, of yours. Is that w- what if you only had one hour in a day? What would it look like? And just to kind of tie things together, one of the reasons was because you were feeling so poorly with your Crohn's disease, you really couldn't do much more than about an hour a day. Is isn't that correct? Yeah, and, and, and like absolutely. And the thing is that I I, I would push back on a lot of people when, when you hear people say that they don't have enough time, oh, I just wish there was more time. Right. Nine times out of 10, those people actually have too much time mm-hmm. uh, and they're just really using it very poorly. Restrictions breed innovation. Yes. Uh, and we, we don't exercise those as much as I honestly, as I think we should, but it's such an interesting sort of mental exercise because if you ask somebody, and I've done this many times, you ask somebody who works like a nine to five, you say, what would happen if you had to leave the office by four and you couldn't work till five? Most of them just say they'd skip lunch. That's usually the answer that comes back, right? But if you ask that same person, well, what if you only had an hour? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's perplexing, right? It requires such a different way of thinking because those things still have to get done, right? Mm-hmm. But if you can't possibly do them in that hour, then who or what is going to do them for you, right? So again, it's, it's that restriction that breeds the innovation that ultimately I think a lot of people end up lacking. What's interesting is that, I mean, Dan Sullivan talks along those same lines where he said it's easier to, I'm going to have the numbers wrong, but it's easier to 10 times your business than it is to have a 2% growth. Yeah. You're just thinking two times times thinking is bad. Yeah. 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 Right. So the idea though, is if you're just starting from where you're at and you're improving a little bit, then you just have to, I don't know, change a little bit. But if you have to completely overhaul everything that you're doing, that comes with a whole different skill set, a whole different um, operating system, if you will. So you're saying that that restriction was actually good for you and you're able to then build out successful businesses. You mentioned coaching and um, consulting and you've written several books in one hour a day or 20 minutes a day. Is that, is that what you're working now? 20 minutes a day? Uh, at, at most. Yeah, usually. And, and so at, at this point, my focus is I do uh, one-on-one private coaching with, uh, I think about two dozen individuals around the world right now. And, uh, I have some courses and stuff that were done previously, but my coaching is primarily my business activity and, uh, it's done entirely asynchronously. So uh, I never have calls. I never have meetings. This is the only scheduled call I actually have this week is with you guys. So asynchronously define what that means for you. Yeah, so the opposite of what we're doing right now, right? So this is synchronous communication, call and response, and there's a place for it. There, there, there certainly is. But so many things that we do that people do that uh, they're just used to doing from culture and from history and whatnot really doesn't need to be done synchronously and actually is really detrimental if it's done synchronously because matching two people up in the same schedules so that they're both like at peak, you know, performance levels is, is, is pretty difficult to achieve. So asynchronous means that I communicate what I want where I want and you receive it when you want, where you want and respond in kind. Now, email is technically an asynchronous tool, but most people just don't use it that way. Same thing with like text messages. The main tool that I use is called Voxer, which is a voice communication tool. Uh, But there's, you know, WhatsApp, iMessage, all sorts of ones. And the technical requirements are not really what's important. It's really about a mindset in terms of what you do. And just to give a concrete image for that, you know, the the way a lot of people will use text messaging, right? Is they'll, they'll, they'll type the message and then they literally, it's like staring at the phone, watching the three dots, like waiting for the response, you know? And obviously if it's something immediate, that's fine. But if it's like, oh, I just need to get a thought out and then go back to what you're doing. Like that's how it's supposed to work. But a lot of people just don't, it ends up holding their attention. Mm-hmm. So um, again, with, so with Voxer, uh, I'm, my clients have unlimited unlimited Voxer access to me. So I have clients, most of my clients I speak to every single day, but sometimes it's for a minute or two at a time. I can speed it up and I can listen to it whenever I want Mm -hmm. uh, and respond in kind. Hey, Rachel, what's interesting, while Ari was talking about this, uh, I got a Voxer notification from one of our clients Mm -hmm. and I, and I actually started this because of Ari. So this is uh, the universe telling people, Hey, you, you need to do this. You know, it's interesting that on the same note, I mean, there's apps like Bonjoro or like video sending message apps. Um, I personally love Marco Polo. 
for a very similar reason. I have friends that I want to communicate with and just not even on the business side, but sometimes there's just so much life that you want to ask about or you want to tell about and lining up schedules when you have young children and a business that you're running just really doesn't make sense all the time. And I've found that it's much more effective to actually communicate the things that are on my mind and hear what's actually on their mind when we have that a asynchronous communication. I never actually thought of it in those terms. So thank you for sharing that. And I think that just gives so much more of an expanded idea, again, thinking outside the box to how you can possibly serve people at a high level, serve lots of people at a high level and not just here's my course that you purchase and have no access to me, but one-on-one -on -one coaching, as you mentioned, but you're not doing this where you're having 24 time blocks every single week to serve those 20, you know, half, I think you said two dozen clients. I mean, well, and here's the thing about that. So, uh, well, first of all, you can really push limits on this stuff. So I do my sales over Voxer as well. I don't do sales calls. People have to get on mm -hmm. Voxer and have a conversation with me. And at that point, it's like either they're going to like the platform or they're not. And then they're probably not going to be a good fit for me. And I'm really, really adamant about this. I mean, I use it with friends. I use it with my mother. Uh, and we, I just, it's just such a more effective way of of uh, communicating. And I, I literally like, I do not do calls. I mean, I'll do interviews and stuff like this, but I just don't do calls just for the sake of doing a call. Uh, but the fascinating thing for me with the coaching particularly is it's so much more effective because as you just mentioned, the 24 time blocks, right? So the way I used to do coaching is people would get like an hour meeting with me once a week, right? So let's say that that person's meeting is Wednesday at 10 a.m., on Friday, then the week before, they have some issue. They're pissed off because they had some thing with an employee or whatever. So they're supposed to like hold on to that and maybe process it or maybe not write it down, who knows, and then bring that to our Wednesday meeting at 10 a.m., blocked out for 45 minutes to an hour to get the three-minute answer that they actually need from me. Mm -hmm. As opposed to now, they walk out of the meeting, they, they, they say what they need to say. I hear the emotion in their voice, which honestly usually tells me so much more than the words they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I can think about it for a couple hours, maybe, maybe less, and then respond with that 30-second like silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Well, just huge uh, blowing up the limitations on scaling your time and leveraging your time and using your minutes to do the most good. And that's, that's powerful and profound in itself. So let's talk about that business owner now who is saying, okay, this is really interesting to me. How do I start leveraging my time rather than just, okay, I'm going to start using asynchronous communication. That's one piece perhaps, but this whole idea and you know, you start, you laid it out as optimize, automate, outsource. I mean, we hear this from so many other venues as well, whether it's doing the, um, the quadrant exercise, what's um, urgent and what's actually not even that important in your life. How can you delegate the things that you really shouldn't be spending time on? How do you spend most of your time on your high leverage activities that are your unique ability that you are designed to do? And how do you then build that team around yourself? So from your perspective, Ari, where does somebody start? I mean, you said the word optimize is, is the beginning port, part, point. <laughs> Too many words I'm trying to combine in one spot here. <laughs> How does somebody get started with that? My time is floundering. I'm working way too many hours down to really zoning in and honing and refining to using their time to the best of their ability. Yeah. So <laughs> there's, it's sort of a, a dual path that for the most part, there's like the communication side of it. And then the optimizing, which really starts with a lot of identification sort of self-tracking and awareness to some extent. And this is, I'm not, this is not like a philosophical thing. And you really, people who experience the feeling of overwhelm, a lot of times it, it's, it, they're so overwhelmed that they have no idea what's causing the overwhelm, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you, I always like to say, you can't read the label from inside the jar. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we have to start tracking and identifying those things. Because again, I tell you that the when people say they don't have enough time, I promise you most of the time they just have too much and they're mm -hmm. just using it really, really poorly. And most of them don't know. Um, there used to be a really basic app or tool, which I think might still exist, but it's called I Done This. And all it did was at 6 p.m. every night, it would send you an email and say, what'd you get done today? And you're supposed to respond to the email with the things you did and it would sort of keep track for you and you know give you stats and stuff. And I remember that, so I had like a 700 day streak uh, with I done this several years ago. This is probably eight years ago. But uh, the majority of the time, I'd get that email at six o'clock, and I would have to look at my calendar to remember what I had done the last, you know, eight hours, 
mm-hmm. because so much stuff was happening. So just that alone is like indicative of how little we're kind of aware of everything that's going on. So if you start to do that, you can track things with a piece of paper. You can use apps like rescue time. You can use devices like the time alert. There's all these things to do it with. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, but start with something because then you're going to start finding out that you're spending, you know, half your week on sales meetings or something, or uh, way, way more time on email than you should. Email is a whole other conversation that we probably should get into, but Understanding that also gives people an element of control and control, in my opinion, is the antidote to stress. Mm -hmm. No, that's absolutely true. And I'm going to even just back up for a second. When you said the limitation on your time causes you to get better. It's so interesting because we were building in business. And at one point we had our first daughter in full-time school. And I think we were at something like nine hours a day or something like that. This was back when we were just getting business off the ground. It was interesting. At one point I thought, well, if I start, you know, shortening that time up, how am I going to have as much time in business? It was interesting as we shortened the time up and we got her out of school, more time and more time at home, my time increased my productivity increased. Then we started looking at, okay, a baby's on the way. We're going to have another baby. And as we had that limitation, we had a brand new baby in the house. Our, our profitability and our tightness on the things that actually matter and staying in our zone and in our lane actually increased. And it's so interesting that that almost has been a gift for me as well, that shrinking the time. So you're talking about self-awareness and tracking the things that you actually do. I think so many times it can just be that, um, you're just flailing because you're just reacting to the first thing. Here's this, some, some message in my inbox. And so I'm going to go spend time on that. And then I've got this five other apps and windows open and you don't have that deep work. Like Cal Newport talks about having deep work on one specific thing that you set up the day before to allocate that hour or that time block or that four hour chunk to specifically work on. You're just doing all the things instead of actually getting the one thing done that you need to do. So how does that where do you, in your system, where do you figure out what are my things that I actually need to be putting time into? So uh, it, one sort of visual that I always like to give, and, and uh, I, were you guys ever fans of MacGyver? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Matter of fact, that was my, so, nickname, nick, my nickname for a long time. Oh, that's awesome. So Nobody ever said to MacGyver, like, hey, MacGyver, here's a shopping cart and there's a Home Depot. Like, go pick up whatever you need and let's go, like, blow, blow up that building, right? It was always like, here's a paper clip and a box of Bisquick and a rubber band. Go blow up the building, right? So it, it, that the, the human brain actually does really poorly with, like, lots and lots of options. We, we kind of, people love to talk about thinking outside the box, but we still need to have a box of some mm-hmm. sort in order to do that. So again, it's like those restrictions are really where the innovation come from. And I would even go so far as to say that uh, a lot of people really lack the restrictions that they think that they have or that people actually did have before, such as money. Um, you know, even now with the pandemic, like businesses are getting funded in ways that they never were historically, you know, maybe for the tech boom. But when you give somebody with a startup, you know, a $5 million check, sure, they might have a plan of how to use it. But it, I, I, I've just seen it. It literally kills innovation, in my opinion, mm-hmm. uh, in most cases. Uh, you tell somebody like, hey, we're going to get you uh, all these resources and stuff and you're going to have, you know, 12 hours a day to do whatever you want. It just, it, it doesn't have the effect that people expect. So we, we need to sometimes create those restrictions. So in terms of identifying what you're going to be doing, uh, it's actually, a, a, you mentioned Dan Sullivan before, it's a really cool uh, activity that's sort of an adaptation of his, which is you take three circles, right? And in those three circles, you have one that's just the things that you're amazing at, excellent at, your highest and best, you know, your unique ability, again, as you also referred to but earlier, you put those three to five things in that circle. The second circle is the things that you're competent at, meaning like you're good, but you're not amazing, uh, but you can get it done. And then the third one is the things that you're bad at, but you're still doing anyway. All right. And you do that. And inevitably what we find, right, is that the, the first circle is stuff that you should be focusing on. The second circle is things that you probably should be having team members or partners or maybe employees, but not just sort of random outsourcers or delegate, like somebody who's sort of involved in the team, maybe if you have that. And the third one is things that you really should just straight up get off your plate, outsource, doesn't matter really who, as long as it's someone competent. Uh, and that, it sounds really simple, but it's sort of, it's a really good way to sort of take stock. 
Mm-hmm. The next level of that is something that I created, which is called the ultimate KPI. And this is a framework that I just, I really love this. It's really, it's very powerful. So what we do is we have a list uh, and there's a worksheet for this, but you don't need it. Honestly, it's very simple. You just write down the 20 things that you do on a regular basis. And it can be sort of as micro or macro as you want. It could be uh, podcasting, you know, or podcast interviewing, being interviewed on podcast. Like you can kind of take it as high level or low level as you want, but just the 20 things that sort of you do the most regularly. And then you want to take 16 of those things. So 80%, right? Thinking 80, 20 and identify the 16 things that you will no longer do at all mm-hmm. in a year's time. So it's a really sort of interesting ego exercise for some people. Oh, sure. So once you do that, then we look at how can we optimize or automate or outsource this thing out of our off our plates. We never ever do it. It's really fascinating. And then you want to track your progress towards that goal throughout the year. So what I love about this reason I call the ultimate KPI is that you can use it for pretty much anybody at any position in any business, right? This can be for a founder of a startup to the COO, to the, the janitorial services, if you want, honestly, and we've, I've, I've, we've done this. Uh, and then Rather than saying like, oh, the salespeople had this sales metric this month and the operations people had this revenue, whatever it might be. Now you're just like, there's 16 things we're supposed to get rid of. This mm. month, I got rid of two. Mm. You know, next month, nothing. So that's not good. We got to figure out what's going on. But it's a fascinating way to sort of track people's progress towards replaceability, which is what we really want. I love that. And I think... There's a question that comes up for me, and I know it comes up for other people as well along this path, that there's that jumping off a cliff moment that you have to do something that you've never done before that's completely new and different that can bring up probably a lot of fear. Um, This, okay, I'm not good at this. I'm doing it. I'm spending my time in it. I know it's $10 an hour work. I know that it's using up a gigantic part of my day that is not in my unique ability. It's not my highest leverage activity to be doing. I need to delegate that. I haven't delegated this kind of work before. It's going to be a lot of work to hire somebody, to train them, to get them to be able to do these things. So where do, what do you, what's your answer to that concern? Uh, so <laughs> most people are, like the vast majority of people are really terrible at delegating. Uh, and, and what's worse is that they just assume that they're actually good at it. Uh, same thing with decision making, actually. Emails, for mm-hmm. example, there's a lot of things that are kind of like thrust upon people that we feel like, oh, we can do that. It's no problem. We'll just tell somebody to do something. I, I can do it. it it's, it's very, very misguided. Worse so, the reason that it is OAO, right? Optimize, automate, outsource, that order actually matters quite a bit because most people in that situation will just say, like, I, I, we're growing, we need more people, or I'm overwhelmed, I need this, I need an assistant. Uh, my favorite is when people talk like post on Facebook that, you know, oh, I'm looking for an assistant to take over my inbox, which I could go on a very, very angry rant about that if we have time. Um, <laughs> the, uh, let's let's uh, do that rant without the angry in, in just yeah. a second. So, yeah. So, but so the, we want to w- people people mess up processes, right? We mm-hmm. want to get to people last because, first of all, if we give an inefficient problem or an poorly articulated issue to somebody else, it's kind of like sweeping the dirt under the rug, right? It doesn't actually address the problem. In many cases, it makes it worse. If we uh, outsource to somebody or delegate before we automate something, which nowadays we can automate, you you can automate something today for free that a week ago, you literally had to hire somebody to do uh, just Mm -hmm. because of the way technology has been changing. And a lot of things people just aren't even aware that you can automate. If you give automatable work to a human being, you are in essence dehumanizing them. And that's no good mm. either. So people are the last line of defense. And it's not because people will mess things up. It's because, well, they probably will, honestly, if you put them in that situation the wrong, at the wrong time. But you're not going to get engagement from somebody who's doing work that they shouldn't be doing. You're not going to mm-hmm. get growth. You're not going to get commitment. Uh, and you're not going to grow as a leader if you do that. So outsourcing really needs to be the very last step. And once you get to that, then there's a whole sort of framework in terms of how we do that. But unless you're well into 
doing a million dollars in revenue in your company, you probably should not be looking at hiring people. Maybe contractors, maybe virtual assistants, things like that, but really not team members at that point. All right, do you have any tips for telling a narrow-minded person they're narrow-minded? And I, I don't mean to be flippant about that, but um, you know, you just said that most people are terrible at making decisions. How do you get those points across to people? Or how do you get that aha moment with your clients that where they say, yeah, you're absolutely right. I shouldn't be doing this. So I, I, I would like to think that that's a bit of the skill of coaching that I, I, I very much had to work on developing. I was not good at coaching. I would say the first year or so, I really had to like figure it out. But at this point, there's, it really depends on the person. There are definitely those people and it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman or whatever, that there's definitely people who need the tough love and need to be told like that this is just stupid what you're doing. Like that doesn't make any sense. Uh, then there's the people who need to just see that it could be another way. And that's usually a, a nicer kind of way to do it. But uh, a lot of there, there's two issues that come along, two main issues that come along with the narrow mindedness or the closed mindedness. One is ego and the replaceability aspect is really fascinating for me because for me, and I, it just, it's, sometimes it just has to be explained, right? So being replaceable in my mind, it's not about getting replaced, right? We want to be able to replace you and people in the organization up, not out. We want the business to be able to run for you, to help you rather than in spite of you. Mm-hmm. And if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted, right? Gets you stuck. But the other side of it, a lot of times is just not being aware that these things are even possible. You have somebody who's been in business for years or decades, or they haven't, they just came from, you know, the finance industry and there's a certain way they do it. And now that's how we do it here to keep doing something because that's how we've always been doing it is a really bad reason to keep doing something. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you kind of really concretely show somebody, look, it could be like this, you literally could have this done by a free automation. Don't have to hire anybody to do this. And that person that you're paying to do it right now, they could be doing these other much better things. Um, it, it's usually works pretty well. So you know, it sounds like the, in many ways, it just might be a lack of imagination or a lack of knowledge about a resource that might be able to solve the very thing that you're trying to solve over and over with your own grunt force. Yeah, there, there, there's definitely a lack of knowledge for sure. Like I, whether or not you're, I mean, I'm, I'm 39. So I think I'm, that technically makes me a millennial, but my generation, younger generations, older, it doesn't generally matter. There's just, if you don't look for these things, a lot of times you're not going to know that you can automate these things. You know, it's the same idea of people who you talk about them using virtual assistant. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't like the idea of, you know, somebody that like, I don't know, or I haven't met or something. And it's, it's just, it's like what well, you're really limiting yourself in because hopefully this amazing, intelligent person who wants to work for the salary you're offering lives in the same zip code as you. That, that you know, good luck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bruce, was there another part of that question? We've actually, I, I have three things I want to ask Ari about. And also we've got some questions on YouTube as well. So um, Bruce, was there another piece? Yeah, mine's a little bit more in another direction. So go ahead and, and stay with what you were going to and the, and the questions from YouTube. Okay. So um, you mentioned delegating. People are not very good at delegating. You mentioned decision-making. People are not very good at decision-making. Um, I realized that there is a difference between the part of me who's planning or being the executive of my life and the other part of me who is working as me. And I heard this distinction in a powerful way before that said, you know, you make the plan. I'm going to do this at this time. I'm going to spend one hour on this. I'm going to spend 20 minutes on this. And then you get into that thing. You're like, well, actually I needed three hours and work or you changes the whole entire plan. And you realize that you're kind of running out of control and not flowing and not doing what the executive you planned to do and and that there's actually benefit in stopping the work whatever it is that you're working on while you're in a state of flow so that you can your brain can continue working on it until the next time but what do what can what can somebody do to be better at decision making specifically um so have an actual framework for it right so the way that i teach the decision making thing is actually around the inbox and email So let's go with that. uh, That was my next question. So you can talk about the whole piece there. So 
every time I sort of, every time I give a talk somewhere and, and have for you know, a number of years now, I always like to ask people, what's your biggest productivity challenge? And invariably in multiple countries, multiple continents, like the email is the first thing that comes up, All right? It's always email, email's overwhelming, email's overwhelming. And my argument is that email, the email problem is not an email problem, it's a decision-making problem. And the, the email inbox is sort of an unusual, somewhat unique scenario that most of us have in our day where you're presented with the opportunity to make hundreds or even thousands of decisions that you wouldn't otherwise. The other thing is that people misuse email as a tool in their overall sort of communication pattern. So, so communication is one area. It's pretty much the only area in sort of productivity where I actually like people to have multiple tools. I wouldn't say that for project management or bookkeeping, but for communication, you really want to have different types of communication tools for different types of communication. Uh, and so many people just try to bunch everything into one. So one hard, hard rule for me with companies and clients that I work with is email is a terrible tool for internal communication with a team. Should, should never be used for internal communication between team members. You need to be using another tool. It doesn't matter if that's Slack or Teams or smoke signals, I don't care, but email is just not designed for that and makes it multitudes worse when you try to use that internally. Uh, and I, I could go into the reasons behind that, but that's probably, it, it's very technical stuff and psychological stuff that doesn't matter right now. Just take okay. my word for it. Shouldn't use it. Uh, so, that's the one thing. So one thing is like, we, we, if, if you stop doing that, right? So you start immediately getting less email to begin with. The other issue with email for a lot of people is that it's it, it taxes our context switching ability, which is what some mm -hmm. people would think of as multitasking, but most inboxes, right? The typical inbox is like super important email, super important email, Facebook, Twitter, Groupon, news, super important email, super, you know, like, and that back and forth switching is just really, really difficult for us. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is when it comes to actual email is we need to separate the essential from the optional as automatically as possible. And the simplest way to do that is a very, very old hack that I've written about for years, which is to create a filter in Gmail is called a filter and Outlook is called a rule. Any email that has the word unsubscribe in it should skip your inbox and go into an optional folder that you call optional which generally takes care of about 65% or so of emails mm -hmm. that people get. Now you can also add in exceptions very easily, such as your kid's school or, you know, the camp that they go, whatever you want it to be so that those emails come through, but we need to, those to skip the inbox. So right away we start to clean it up and know that a lot more of what's in the inbox is actually essential and, and interesting to deal with. And those optional emails aren't being deleted. They're now in this optional world. So when I switch into the optional folder, I'm now in optional mode. I can go through those a lot more easily if I mm -hmm. choose to. But for the actual emails that are in the inbox, and this is where the decision-making comes in, you have three choices and only three, and you can only handle an email once. You don't want to read an email, mark it on red, come back to it later. It just doesn't work. We delude ourselves with this idea of later, right? Mm -hmm. That's future self's problem, right? So the... Uh, three D's deal with it. I'm sorry, delete it, deal with it or defer it. Those are your three choices and only those. So the first one's de delete it. If we're talking about real life decisions, decline, deny, say no, right? Yes. Got you to where you are, but no, we'll get you to where you're going. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. And 40% or so of the emails that people respond to never required a response in the first place. Meaning when we send an email, that's like, got it. Thanks. Okay. You know, like, don't do that because there's a boomerang effect to email. The more email you send, the more email you will get. So say no, delete it. Second one is deal with it. Now, this is a fascinating one because if you can deal with it right now, meaning like in the next two or three minutes, and it's not going to require a major mental shift, deal with it right now, right? This, like, this idea is like, oh no, I'll take care of this later when I have a, you know, it's only going to take me a minute. It's like, that's, you're just, again, you're fooling yourself. And anybody who has kids knows that like later is not a place, right? Later is a uh, time when yeah. someone's hungry or somebody's, you know, has to take a bath or something, right? So there's no later. Deal mm -hmm. with it right now. And you'll have that sense of accomplishment. And more importantly, the worst thing you can do, in my opinion, as a leader or part of a team or in any sort of partnership is delay the other person from doing what they need to do. So if you could answer that and you know email now, you can make a decision, you can let something move forward and you don't for an hour or two or more, you're creating a massive butterfly effect that will come back to bite you at some point. 
Now, dealing with it could include deferring, oh, I'm sorry, de uh, delegating it, right? Because as far as I'm concerned, if you delegate effectively in that moment, you're done. So this is, hey, this is an email. I can respond to it because I need to, or, oh no, uh, virtual assistant has to take care of this, or the bookkeeper has to take care of this. Forward it, handle this, done. The third one is the most complex and interesting. So if you can't say no and you can't deal with it right now, then you have to defer it. And deferring it means choosing actively deciding there is a better time and place for me to deal with this particular kind of issue, whether that is finance related or creative or a uh, major decision or legal, whatever it might be. And you defer those emails to those times. And in Gmail, you can use the built-in snooze functionality to do that. Uh, if you're using Outlook, I, I believe there's something similar. And so you say like, all right, this is finance. I deal with finance on Friday mornings, you know, snooze Friday, 9 a.m. And then you can start to actually batch your time, do things more effectively, focus on one thing for even 15 minutes, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, and not be in this constant state of sort of putting out fires. It's And own your time. Because mm -hmm. if you don't own your schedule, somebody else is going to. Yes. No, that's really, really interesting. I know that there's um, just one, one piece that I'll even share as an example. Um, I knew for, you know, months and months, CEs are something in our industry that we have to focus on. And there's, there's a two year time period that you have to have a certain number of continuing education credits. And I just realized that I was not going to keep this on a lingering to-do list because it was just draining my energy thinking about, I'm going to eventually have to do this. So I put a time block of, uh, I don't know, a 30 minute time block on my calendar for a specific date, a specific time. And I said, I'm going to schedule all my CEs at that exact time. And I'm never going to have to have this mental energy going into this thing that's on a lingering to-do list or sitting in my email inbox from all these companies saying, oh, hey, you can use my company to, to do your CE because I already know which company I'm going to choose and I can do all of that at one time. It was a huge productivity um, jump start for me to be able to focus that time and attention. And so I'm hearing when you say defer, you're saying put it on the calendar. Don't just put it on a random to-do list somewhere that's still draining your energy anyways. Put it on the calendar to say this is exactly when I'm going to handle it. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, and again, it's that control that's really important. Mm -hmm. Or do you do you coach people who email you also not to email you? Got it. Thanks. You know, so on and so forth. Is that part of being productive too? And then I also coach you know, some of my people stop copying me on emails. I don't need to be copied. Uh, so my, my coaching is exclusively through Boxer. There is no other place. Uh, I don't do emails. I don't do calls. I don't do Zoom calls, anything. It is all done through Boxer. Um, yeah, I, I, use, I use the word coach probably wrong. I mean, when you have somebody on your team that is, you know, emailing you and saying, you know, hey, I got it, Ari, or I'll take care of it. Do you then coach them, not one of your coaching oh. clients, but do you then coach them to say, hey, you don't need to do this. I trust you. This is more productive. If you just go run with it, I trust that you're going to get do, you know, take care of it. And you don't need to copy me on unnecessary emails and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about your coaching clients. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so the, the, the natural sort of question that comes up for people when I say you can't use email internally is, well, what if an email comes from an external source that I want to discuss with somebody internally? All right. So then uh, there's, there's, there's a couple different ways to handle it. The main one is to use a shared inbox tool, right? So something like Intercom or Front or Drift. Uh, Drift. Um, so basically, so for example, I have Ari at lessdoing.com, that's my email, but we have OAO at lessdoing.com, which is the sort of general. So when I go to events or I meet people, whatever, I, I, I never give out Ari at lessdoing.com, not for privacy reasons, just because I, I give out the general one. Now that OAO email goes into intercom, which anybody on my team can see and respond to. Um, and if we need to discuss it, you can even make a note to somebody on the team internally. You can discuss it right there and it's a separate tool, right? So it's not the inbox, it's not Slack, whatever it is, intercom or whatever the tool is that you're using. Um, so it's very obvious when somebody has dealt with it or not. Uh, and if they, you know, if it's sitting there for a little while. And, and also what that means is that if that person is out or quits or whatever, somebody else can immediately jump in and take over that communication very, very seamlessly. So uh, it's really about having that infrastructure set up properly. That's good. There Excellent. Go. Excellent. Okay. We've got some YouTube questions that are excited to get some answers here. So um, some of these probably are, you might see on your own YouTube, this should be 
compiling from everywhere. Um, so we have Mr. Ian. Hello, Ari. Love what you're doing. Um, he also says, I got a question in a video. You mentioned you work for just 20 minutes. How do you manage to even complete your primary task in that small time interval? So go ahead. I'll, I'll let you answer that one. So, I mean, 20 minutes is an estimate and it's like an outside estimate. So it's, sometimes it's a lot less. <laughs> sometimes it's like it, not anything um, in a day. So um, I have a pretty short attention span, honestly, for a lot of this stuff and, or yeah, attention span is probably what it is. <laughs> and I was the patience, but it's, it's really attention span. And so uh, I pretty much have like a 15 minute limit for myself for some sort of a new big kind of project. Now, I, I can't complete a really big project in 15 minutes. I certainly couldn't do a book in 15 minutes, but where there's a will, there's a way. And where there's a restriction, there's a way. So my last book on productivity is a series of, I think, 48 Voxer messages to my writer, Amy. Uh, which I did over the course of maybe six weeks. Uh, she would ask me something. I would respond, you know, in a 10 minute message, whatever it might be. And then she wrote it. Um, I'm doing a fun sort of side project right now on the world's oldest companies, which is, it's really, really fascinating. There's companies that have been operating continuously for several hundred years in the world right now. And uh, it's an Instagram page that we're doing called world's oldest companies. And it's the same kind of thing. And Amy, again, this just happens to be, she's my creative sort of outlet, but uh, I could send her a 20 second message and then she can go ahead and write a thousand word blog post from that, no problem. Uh, and we've, we've developed that relationship, but plenty of people can do that with writers. So it, it, that's, it's a really good example. Let's say I need to write you know, a 2000 word blog post. I'm gonna give myself five minutes. It's not possible, right? So what do I do? Well, I'm gonna have to, send a voice message because I can, I can uh, convey the message really well with voice and emotion and everything uh, to someone who's then going to write it. All right. So who or what is going to do it for you? Another good example is uh, social media syndication, right? So I created an automation, which I wrote, I wrote about on medium. You guys can check that out if you want. It's got all the details of how to do it. Uh, so if I do a one minute or 30 second, whatever Facebook live video, that will automatically be turned into podcast, blog posts, social media posts, uh, uh, YouTube video, all sorts of stuff, completely automatically. Um, so not only do I have not have to do that, I don't have to think about doing that. I don't have to hire somebody to do it. It's completely automated. Uh, and it takes one minute of my time to create a month of content. So I have a question, a follow-up question on that. How do you allocate the time to figure out the new technology, to research the new technology, or do you have somebody else on your team doing that and learning how to use new technology? Is that all delegated as well? No. So that, but to me, you know, that doesn't feel like work to some extent, right? Because I feel like my job in many ways is content, even mm -hmm. if it's coaching, it's content, right? And so mm -hmm. a lot of that involves learning. And that's one of the things that I really get to do with my time. Awesome. And the, the thing is, is that, I, so like, so I got back, uh, I got home this morning at uh, 7 a.m. after spending, you know, the night with a whole bunch of drunk people because I'm an EMT. Um, so I, I volunteer as an EMT a couple of nights a week. And that's something that I, I love doing. I've been doing that for over a decade now. Uh, I, the majority of my time during the day while my kids are at school is spent woodworking in my shop my workshop at, on, at my house, building things, right? And so it's in those times that uh, I'm exposed to a lot of things. I get to learn a lot of things. I listen to podcasts I, 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 and I just absorb things and get ideas. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of times people end up acting or not acting, but utilizing techniques that they've never actually experimented with. Right. And then if they don't work for them, then it's like, oh, they're just unproductive. And that's just the way it is. And maybe they'll try something else. But if we look at the things that we do as experiments, meaning that there's an opportunity mm -hmm. to fail, to learn from it, to change things, to tinker and, you know, noodle and obsess in some cases, it really changes the perspective, I would say, on how we work.
Mm, that's excellent. And I love the idea that there's so much value in having those inputs, whether you're reading or you're listening to podcasts or you're, uh, you have a book on an audio book that's playing or you're reading articles from different, um, different industries even because that fuels your creativity to be able to think about things differently when you hear something. I mean, even from woodworking, you're getting the real time um, feedback from that that's then teaching you something about communication, which is just so interesting how our brains can cross across um, so many, so many levels doing that. So let's go ahead and look at another question here. Um, I do not know how to pronounce this. Um, Ari, I'm doing a 12 hour job and cannot really learn any new things. So how do I go for new things and go for the path to financial freedom? 12 hour job and can't can't learn new things that cannot really learn any new thing. Um, there's more part here. I do a hundred dollar job per month. I'm not sure I'm understanding this correctly, but this is what it says. I do $100 job per month and it's a 12 hour job. How do I go from here to financial freedom? Now I'm 22 and I don't have a lot of time left in a day to learn new things and earn more from now. That, so Look, the, here's the thing. First of all, I, I, I think it's really important that I just point out that the, me working at 20 minutes a day, like that's not something that I would tell somebody you can do that tomorrow. You know, this isn't a get rich quick kind of thing. Like that's taken me 11 years to get to that point where I can do that. Uh, but, uh, and I don't know anything about this person other than that comment, but there's always, there's always time. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I've, I have four small children and I volunteer overnight as an EMT. Like I, th there's always time somehow, you know, and maybe that's listening in your car for 15 minutes, or maybe that's read it. That, uh, there, there's, <laughs> you have to make that time. I promise you, there's probably something else you're doing with the rest of the 12 hours in the day uh, that you might be able to exchange for the, the idea of learning. And, you know, I, I, not, I'm not necessarily a Gary Vee fan, but he's always talked about like the, there's the nine to five and then the seven to two, mm -hmm. you know, the 7 PM to two in the morning, right. Where you, you work and you on the other side thing, get things done. And that's not necessarily healthy long-term, but sometimes you just have to work harder. That's the thing with this. And I have worked very, very hard in my life. This is not about actually doing less overall this is about doing less of the things that are not an effective use of your time mm -hmm. that's well said and it's so interesting that i think we all have resources available to us that sometimes we just don't see in the moment and that could be while you're taking a shower listening to a podcast it could be while you're i don't know while you're putting your hair and makeup together uh, if you're a girl if you're shaving if you're a guy if you're in a position of you know there are times that that fueling your brain and continually getting better, that growth mindset and choosing to, to think differently is uh, really valuable. And look, I'll, uh, one more thing I'll just say is let's say you really, it's true. You really don't have time to learn anything else. Okay. But in the things that you're doing in the day, just try to think to yourself at one point in the day, like, what if I did this a different way? Mm. You know, what if, what if I didn't have that hour to do this? Like, just forget learning at that point, just try to figure it out. And see what and then you might not come up with anything good, but try. Mm, that's good. All right. So then we've got here another question. What's your opinion on the second most productive person after you, Theodore Roosevelt? And uh, this person also then asks another question. I'll just give you both at once here. How do you deal with FOMO or the fear of missing out? Because a lot of people can't prioritize their tasks just because they find something else very appealing and enough to distract them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the second most productive. Well, so, but I have to think about that for a second. If you want to learn what makes people successful or productive, like don't, don't learn about what they do and try to do what they do. Just try to learn about how they think, uh, because that's how you're actually going to be able to emulate maybe and learn from those things. Um, the second most productive person. That's a, that's a really interesting. That's a funny question. I, I, that's a bit of a stumper, I have to say. Uh, I guess uh, there, a, a lot of people would probably say like Tim Ferriss would be one. Mm -hmm. And um, Tim, Tim's been on my podcast a few times. I know Tim well. Like it's it's very different 
scenario, I would say. Um, Tim doesn't have a family. Tim's got a whole bunch of other things going on. But uh, a lot of his concepts are really, were really groundbreaking. Um, so let's go with that. Tim Ferriss. Um, and then uh, yeah, and FOMO. <sighs> FOMO is a, a really big problem for a lot of people. It definitely is. And I think that this is going to sound really sort of pessimistic in some ways, but a lot of times when people have FOMO, it's because they just don't have a very interesting life that they haven't focused on and created for themselves. Um, I would, I, I swear to you, like at this, I, so woodworking is a, is a pandemic pickup for me. Like that was something mm-hmm. that I picked up over the pandemic and fell in love with it. And it's something that I spend a lot of my time on. Uh, I, I would, I would be happy to spend 10 hours working on woodworking stuff and not think about anything else that's happening on social media or whatnot, just because I'm so engrossed in it. Um, and I would say that this is a problem for men, particularly just in my experience. Um, and a lot of men nowadays lack some very essential things that I think historically men need, such as a hobby. Um, you know, I, 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 re- and I really do. And I, I, I pretty much equally, I think over the years code, pretty equally men and women. And I just find that it's it's much more of an issue with men. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, thank you for just sharing your thoughts and and opinions on that and your experience. Um, Just thanks for sharing your wisdom with us today. I think um, it is always fascinating to talk with somebody who is using the techniques that they are talking about. And you have not just created these ideas and then coach somebody on these ideas, you have lived them. And that's why you are experimenting in your own life with how they work and how to improve your productivity and work within those restrictions and still get out of life what you want by putting what you want into life, just thinking about it from a different angle. So thank you for sharing that. I think, um, you know, that relates back even to someone's financial life. If you're in a position of saying, here's all the dollars that I have, I can't conceptualize any way to do my money better, to make it go further, to use it more wisely. There's always another way. There's always another strategy that you can implement. There's always a different, even beneath the the financial products, beneath the strategies, there's financial principles and thinking about what those financial principles are and how to put yourself in a position of control, which Ari, I know you use that word in terms of your time and your resources, but we think about it in terms of financial control as well the way that you have most control over your financial resources and use them to the best of your money's ability, do the most with your money that allows you to be able to do so much more than maybe even what you see right now. So I just wanted to mention that here as well as we're on the Money Advantage podcast, regularly helping people to take control of their financial life and get into a position of creating cash flow from assets, building time and money freedom. And if that's something you're interested in, we would love to have you come over and meet us on themoneyadvantage.com and you can take those steps towards building that financial freedom in your life. Now, Ari, before we part ways today, how can somebody find you to most specifically connect in and start applying some of these ideas that you've shared with us today? Yeah, th- so thank you again for having me. And so everything about me is at lessdoing.com, but uh, people can actually go to voxwithre.com if they want, and they can get in touch with me on Voxer. And it's me, it's not an automation, it's not a VA or anything, it's actually me. And I really do welcome that. So reach out, ask questions, let me know what's uh, your biggest productivity challenge. Awesome. Well, Ari, thank you so much for being with us today. This has really been a pleasure. And uh, go get some rest or woodworking or whatever you're going to do next. But go it sounds like shop. I was going to say, it sounds like you maybe haven't slept for a while. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for spending the hour with us today. It's been really productive for us and for our team as well. Thanks, guys. All right. In closing, remember, success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business 